at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, the 27th of January. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come in, come in, make yourself at home. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Live with Littlewood. On the 27th of January, 1820 was the day that a Russian expedition discovered Antarctica. And I see it's been a bit sub-zero in the UK this week. Luckily for me, I'm still broadcasting from the much sunnier climes of my hotel room in Tenerife, although I assume I'll be getting back to Britain at some point in the future. Not quite sure yet whether I'll have to spend 10 days at the Gatwick Hilton on my way back to my flat. Possibly, possibly not. On this day in 1973, the US and Vietnam signed the ceasefire that ended their 19-year conflict. And on January the 27th, 1956, Elvis Presley released Heartbreak Hotel, his first million selling single. But it looks like hotel heartbreak for people flying back to the UK from high risk countries. Don't blame me. I don't write this script. I just read it out. Um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said today travellers to the UK from 22 countries. But I think in a clarification, it's uh, actually 30 countries will have to go into hotel quarantine. The new rules apply to the red list countries uh, where there's the most concern over a new virus variant. Um, And in the last couple of hours, Home Secretary Priti Patel announced that people wishing to travel out of the UK will be required to present a reason for their travel and going on holiday is not considered good enough. There'll also be um, uh, considerably greater police presence at airports and ports and fines for those breaking the rules. So much to discuss, much to discuss in this week's show. What are we going to be covering? Well, coronavirus confusion. Uh, Isn't there a massive confusion over what the strategy now really is? On the one hand, we appear to be tightening up. On the other hand, there's growing pressure to reopen schools, not till March the 8th, but uh, perhaps then. Uh, Aren't we seeing a bit of an inconsistent approach from the government in a week when the coronavirus claimed its 100,000th death? Um, in the UK, shouldn't the priority be to get everybody vaccinated uh, and getting people back to work as soon as possible and living their lives more freely? Uh, There's been a row, of course, over the supplies of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Are we in danger of seeing the emergence of kind of vaccine nationalism and protectionism? More of that in a moment, but also coming up later on on the show. Poor thinking. This is the annual report from Oxfam that came out this week, calling for higher taxes on the very richest, well, even on the moderately rich, a a temporary tax on excess profits made by 32 global corporations who've gained the most in the past year. Oxfam called for the additional taxes in their report, the inequality virus, saying a rigged economy has enabled a super rich elite to amass wealth in the middle of a pandemic. I thought that Oxfam used to worry about there being too many poor people in the world, but it seems now they're worried there's too many rich people in the world. Uh, We'll be going through their thinking and arguing, is there a good case that they're against the key thing that relieves poverty on the planet, namely the market economy and the spread of capitalism? Also later on the show, lost generations. This week, unemployment rose to its highest level in five years. Young people are being hit the hardest. New figures also show that it's poor white teenagers, boys in particular, I think, in left behind areas of England, who are the least likely ethnic group to go to university. What does the future hold for this generation of young people, the same generation that will shoulder the bulk of the debts and the deficits that we're accruing, and what can or should be done to help them? That's all coming up over the next 100 minutes or so, and to help me put the world to rights, I am yet again 
joined by a stellar cast of commentators, think tankers, journalists, opinion formers. Later on in the show, Brendan Chilton, Chief Executive Officer of the Independent Business Network and a Labour councillor from Ashford in Kent. Joanna Williams, founder and director of the think tank Keo, Classical liberal author, academic uh, and politician Jamie White. John Ashmore, the editor of Cap. Apex, the website founded to make the case for popular capitalism, markets, innovation and competition, uh, and Len Shackleton, editorial and research fellow at the IEA and professor of economics at the University of Buckingham. They are going to be along with us a little bit later, but first up, I'm delighted to give a very warm welcome back to Tom Harwood, journalist, commentator, senior reporter for the Guido Fawkes website. Tom, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, you're going to Great need to evening. unmute yourself to say good evening. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Hi. And uh, from the home team here at the IEA, making his debut on Live with Littlewood, is the IEA's Chief Operating Officer, Andy Mayer. Andy, how are you? Good evening. Great to see you, Mark. Good, good to see you too. Tom, let me start with, uh, with, with you, because I'm, I've been very interested in um, uh, the Guido Fawkes reporting today on what the Labour Party thinks the prioritisation for vaccinations should be. Can you talk us through it? There's, the idea was to, once we've moved out of the age groups, have I got this right, to prioritise key workers. And you can kind of get that, that, you know, staff on the front line at hospitals. But I think your investigations have uncovered that key workers would include MPs and, um, and journalists. You'd be one of them, wouldn't you, Tom? Worst of all, it would include me, Labour's prioritisation list for the next phase after these top four uh, phases of the of the rollout of the vaccine would be 24 year olds like me getting the vaccine ahead of 65 year olds. It is bonkers. Um, I think the Labour Party have actually started to row back on the figure that they used in the press release, actually, because they realised it included people like Sir Keir Starmer um, and, and journalists and other unpopular uh, figures in the key worker category. Um, but, but even so, the, the, the real thing here is that the JCVI has outlined nine prioritisation categories. The government has said we're going to get through four of these and then continue. And the Labour Party is saying that after the first four, after everyone above the age of 70 has been vaccinated, we should throw out the recommendation of the experts, of the independent group that have said these are the most, these are the, the most acute clinical risk. And instead, what looks like chase after their own political interests in terms of particularly public sector workers. Now, the next six groups that the JCVI has identified account for around 20% of the deaths from coronavirus. Key workers um, who aren't in those groups account for about 1% of the deaths from coronavirus. That's the degree of difference we're talking about here in prioritisation. And we did a quick calculation on the back of a fag packet for the site today, which shows that actually if we delay all of the elderly people in favour of the key workers, that will be an extra 180 deaths every single day of delay. That's really interesting. Do you think, Tom, that the Labour Party just, if you like, shot from the hip a bit too early here? I think they were reliant on ONS stats. They just kind of looked at a spreadsheet. It said there's X number of key workers. They didn't realise that Sir Keir Starmer and Tom Harwood were included in that category. What they were trying to get at, presumably, even if they've screwed up, was getting it to like NHS staff and care home staff, you know, even if these people are in their 20s, possibly teachers as well. I know there's a controversy about that. Um, was this just, if you like, a pretty embarrassing slip of the pen? Or are they worried that Keir Starmer, who, has to, who seems to have to self-isolate about every other week, really should be a priority for the vaccine? I think you're incredibly generous there, suggesting they even looked at a spreadsheet before they uh, whipped out this press release today. Actually, I think what it shows is that they're more led around by the unions and the interests that uh, prop up the Labour Party than anything else. The, uh, the teaching unions particularly have been very, very loud on this idea of vaccinating teachers, even though we know the reason why schools are closed isn't because there's a particular risk to teachers. It's because the, the risk of schools is this vector of transmission, getting it asymptomatically flowing around kids and then that moving up through households and to the vulnerable. The way you open schools 
isn't by vaccinating teachers who are most most of them i think the average age of a teacher is about 30 the way you open schools is by vaccinating the vulnerable but the labor party seems to have thrown out the scientific advice ironic for a party that continually argues that the government should follow the independent science well today they've thrown out the independent science and have chased after what their union paymasters are demanding of them andy what should be the kind of ia free market response here i mean uh, we've obviously uh, had a flurry of media inquiries about whether the vaccine should just be on the open market. You know, Mrs. Miggins, age 98, has got to pay for a vaccination if she wants one. And if you beat her to the punch, then you in your mid 40s get it. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that's not the right way to do it because there's a, a limited supply. You might have a private supply line as well, if that can complement the rollout. But Andy, do you think the government's got this about right in terms of its demographics and its sets and sort of moving down the, the age profiles? I don't know when they start moving on to uh, medical diagnosis <clears throat> as well, if you're a diabetic or whether um, aren't fat people more at risk? So, you know, I'm trying to put on a few pounds to jump the queue. Um, what, how, how do you think, Andy, the government should be going about the rollout? Which, let's just say, in fairness, is going pretty well compared to most of the rest of the world. So in, term, in the terms of the government's own priorities for dealing with the virus, they have prioritised saving as many lives as possible, which would suggest that you should prioritise the vulnerable. And as you say, that means the elderly, uh, those with multiple conditions, the obese, and any other vulnerable at-risk groups. However, from a free market perspective, we are cognizant that there are trade-offs involved in doing this. And we're also cognizant it's not as simple as saying we can just judge this by casualty mathematics. What we could be looking at instead is if we decide there are areas that do need to reopen, such as public transport, the schools, we've already decided this for the hospitals, um, then the prioritisation might need to be a little bit more nuanced. So I've got a little bit more sympathy than Tom does for the Labour Party position on this. I mean, it's terrible politics. They've not been very adroit at all about the way they've presented this. But you could argue, um, as the Guido Fawkes website did, that protecting freedom of the press and free speech is quite important. And uh, that happened in the summer when Extinction Rebellion tried to shut down part of the press. And you could say, actually, it would be a great thing if more journalists were out there able to interview government ministers face to face because they both had the vaccine. And wouldn't that be marvellous? Wouldn't that be the sort of thing that in a free market, free society, you'd want to see people talking to each other in that way through the media? Come on, Andy, we know essential workers, think tankers are way, way ahead of uh, Harwood and his, you know, his, you know, scandal sheet journalism, surely. Why, why does he leap the queue over us? Look at him. He's fit, young and healthy. I've got to be way ahead of him, the bloody list, yeah, surely. To, to undermine my own position, I mean, obviously, the, the counterweight is that most journalism can be done from your own living room. I mean, there isn't really all that much of the case for getting people back into face to face contact. The schools is a different question. And again, bit of sympathy for the unions here. I mean, what they're saying is that their members are scared. Now, that, that fear may not be entirely rational. They may not be as vulnerable as any, uh, or their vulnerability may be no different to anybody else's, marginally increased by their exposure to children, but not much looking at the data. But if their members are making excuses and not coming into work on the basis that they're terrified or they've got vulnerable partners at home or other family members they're looking after, it may make perfect sense to vaccinate the teachers in order that the schools can reopen faster. All right. But surely we can't have the categories being based on how scared you self-identify as, right? It's got to be a more objective criteria than that, right, nerves? But Tom, how would you roll it out? I mean, it seems... Or it's so obvious who, if you like, the first five or 10 million are. I mean, and I think they basically got that right. The over 80s, then the over 70s. It gets a bit murkier after that, doesn't it? I mean, you know, who should be in the queue first out of the three of us? I'm the oldest, but I'm still in my 40s. I know I don't look it, but I've had a hard life. Um, but, you know, as Andy says, maybe you need to do sort of, you know, you're being held back because you can't do your normal door stuffing journalism and really getting the microphone in people's face. How, once we've got through these vulnerable groups, let's say everybody over the age of 65 or whatever it is, how then do we do the, you know, the, the rest of us? Free market, price it up, or do we go group by group by group, presumably putting MPs right at the bottom, right? Well, this isn't a market. We 
we're not asking people to pay for the vaccine. This is something that is about the most status rollout of something that you could possibly imagine. Um, but the but the difference here is that um, unlike uh, the Labour Party suggestion, which is which is saying change up the order that has already been agreed with the JCVI. The JCVI has said that these are nine categories and they account for 99% of the deaths, those nine categories. And I would argue that if you had 99% of the deaths uh, taken away, that's a level that you don't actually need to vaccinate everyone before you open up. If someone is 20 years old, their risk of dying from the coronavirus is lower than the risk of being hit by a car. I mean, that's that's actually a genuine discussion that we should have, um, saying that, you know, once we've taken care of the people who are genuinely really at risk from this horrible disease, doesn't it make sense to actually live with a bit more risk and open up for the people that aren't clinically vulnerable. So these nine groups that take into account people with uh, clinical need, take into account everyone actually over the age of 50, um, 50 is the lowest age in group nine there, that accounts for about half the population and it accounts for 99% of the coronavirus deaths. I would argue that we should complete that as quickly as possible. After those first four groups that are 88% of the deaths, we can start to go back to a tiered system. But once we've got through those nine groups, there aren't there, there isn't much reason for keeping restrictions there at all and and yes we can continue to roll it out but the idea that we'd prevent a journalist from going and interviewing a politician in that situation when the risk is so much lower to the generally vulnerable um i don't think that that's a, a very compelling case but tom is that right i mean i hear so much conflicting stuff on this and i'm not a, a scientist i'm just a principled seeker of the truth as you well know uh, but what I, it isn't the potentially the problem for, that, say, folk in their 40s, Andy and my age, are unlikely to die unless we've got underlying conditions, but there's still a pretty high chance we'll end up on a ventilator, right? And, and if we've got loads of people in their 40s getting ill, okay, we might all come out the other side, having been ill for six or eight weeks, you know, a bit like the Prime Minister. But even if you make it, there's kind of pressure on the healthcare service um, it's not, you know, quite as simple as people in their 20s just get a bit of a sniffle and, and that's it. I mean, isn't the problem, even if the death rate goes right down, the kind of treatment needed for those of us who might be mini vulnerable but not high, high risk is, 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 is still problematic, no? Or at least that's what the public health people will say in arguing for a continued lockdown, no? Certainly. And I think there's a degree of debate that we can can sensibly have about this, recognising the real risks of the viruses, but, but also making um, the case that actually there's a, there's a degree of, uh, of personal risk that we accept in day-to-day -day life. Um, I, I'm not sure of actually the statistics of the people who go on ventilators in their 40s. I know the percentage of people who die in their 40s is much, much lower, but of course the number who go on ventilators is much, much lower as well. There will come a point where actually that is a tolerable um, rate for society to bear. And uh, I, I mean, even even with triage going on in hospitals right now, where they are, they are sort of at capacity and, and, and beds are prioritised for people who are younger, we're still finding that the average person on a bed in a hospital right now isn't in their 40s. They might be in their 50s or, or early 60s. So really, we're going to have to be able to have this discussion saying that, yes, of course, we don't stop the rollout of vaccine. We absolutely ramp that up to as fast as possible. I've been disappointed in the last three days of figures averaging at about 300,000 a day because we really need to be getting closer to 800,000 a day to match what Israel is doing. So uh, as long as we can start to unwind as we roll that vaccination programme out, I don't think there will be that much of a problem in terms of overwhelmed hospitals. Yeah, OK, well, let's look at some of the, the non-vaccine measures. So we've got this rule now. I was looking at it uh, just before we came on air these uh, hot spots, you need to go and stay in a hotel. I was advising all of my staff yesterday, buy shares in Marriott and Hilton. Um, I hope they followed my advice because they are now going to have a highly captive audience. Andy, what, what do you make of this? Everybody who arrives, I, uh, from what I can gather at the moment, the Canary Islands are not on the list and it's actually relatively safe here in Tenerife, I think, compared to most other areas of the world. But you're going to have to come back. You're going to have to stay at a hotel, presumably for it to have any efficacy at all, very close to your point of entry. Um, there's no point in coming in and moving you 200 miles up to a, a hotel in rural Scotland or something. Uh, is this a sensible policy or is this just politicians being seen to you know, do something, Andy? 
I mean, the primary purpose of shutting the borders is a fear of new strains emerging that then cause additional deaths in a way that the current British strain and it's feared the Brazilian and South African strains will also uh, um, cause. The policy itself will have unintended consequences. I mean, on the one hand, what a fantastic boost for the hospitality sector, which, if memory serves, account for about 40% of the unemployment in the additional unemployment incurred in the latest figures. Uh, so I imagine the hotel sector is going to be quite pleased. That is if they can get the staff to come in and service people who may or may not be infected with the coronavirus. It's going to be a bit of a trade-off there as well, but that in turn will generate new sources of employment. What are the unintended consequences you might expect speaks to your 200 mile point. Uh, if everybody is going around the airports and to London where the most capacity is, the regions are going to start moaning, what about us? They're going to want those 200 mile bus rides with security guards, perhaps police outriders taking people from the airport to their new secure government facility. And it's all going to be a bit dystopian. I mean, if memory serves, the government's track record on running hospitality facilities for visitors is the asylum centres. And if that's the kind of level of facility people want, I can imagine we're going to see a fair fall off in people coming in from the red list. True, but they haven't yet nationalised Hilton and, and Marriott. Um, Tom, what do you think of these sort of measures, which one would hope are, are very, very short term? I, I know Pretty Patel quite well. I'm, I'm fond of her. But I wonder if she's got the, the right end of the, the stick here. Here's a few numbers. Um, for you to play with if you want to write a Guido story about this. I mean, not many people are coming into the UK at the moment, but it is over 5,000 a day. In a normal year, about 300,000 people a day uh, arrive in the UK. But even if you've only got 5,000 coming in, I know they won't all be from the hotspots. The total number of estimated sleeping rooms in all of London is 109,000, right? And that even assumes you're moving somebody from Heathrow, I don't know, right over to Bethnal Green to put them up in, the, in a hotel over there. I mean, I can't really see how this is going to work, right? Very, very soon, these hotels will be at capacity. Uh, as Andy says, you know, Hilton and Marriott and Doubletree might be delighted for the business after the rough year they've had. But is this sensible? And what about Pretty's view that, you know, you've got to have a letter to have a good reason to leave the country? I mean, I think uh, the North Koreans have a have a similar policy, don't they, on, on leaving Pyongyang? I think they do. But the other case is that the Australians do as well. And they're a freedom loving democracy. I'm a total absolutist when it comes to borders. I was very sceptical of this stuff over the summer when I thought that we might have to learn to live with the virus and, and all that sort of thing. But actually, now that we've got really effective vaccines and vaccines that we can develop for new strains in a matter of hours with this new mRNA technology, um, I, I think that there are only two answers here, and the government has gone for neither of them. Either you have completely open borders during your pandemic, or you completely close them. And what you're doing by saying we're closing the borders to just some parts of the world is you're encouraging people to get these mystical, magical things that apparently the government has never heard of, and they're called indirect flights. Um, if you have to put yourself up in a hotel from travelling from, I don't know, uh, Belgium, why wouldn't you then fly via Greece to Heathrow and you're absolutely free to go? I mean, it's a total bonkers halfway house. I can imagine the cabinet discussion that they had. Sort of half the people on one end of the table were saying, uh, no, we need to keep it open. The travel industry is really important. And then the pretty Patels around the table were saying, no, close it down. Boris in the middle sits there and goes, you know what? We'll do both. We'll do this halfway house. We'll do this, this camel of a committee decision. And I don't think it goes be, be, be anywhere fair, near Tom, enough. Be fair. I mean, this is progress. When we go back to the first lockdown, the consideration at the cabinet table was, should we allow our friends to go on their skiing holidays in Italy or not? No, they are at least thinking now. So, but Tom, you know, but Tom's got a point, isn't he? That politicians often, often you get a bunch of politicians around the table looking at what Tom, I think, fairly says is a binary decision. And their answer to a binary question is typically 0 0.5, right? And that's, that's essentially what's, what, what has happened here, right? But I mean, I must admit, I'm, I'm a bit confused about what my legal position here is. I've got a fair amount of time left. But given Brexit, I'm only allowed to stay in Tenerife for 90 nights. Um, by the time I come back, it will be about 75-ish if I decide to stay for another couple of weeks. I need to have a, a negative COVID test to be let back in. So I don't know if I test positive on day 87 in Tenerife. I don't know what actually happens to me. I'll have a choice of breaking the law by, I don't know, trying to squirrel my way into the EasyJet luggage hold and get back into the United Kingdom by not, by not um, overextending my stay here, or 
being illegally here. There's all sorts of complexities, right? I mean, we should let British nationals back in pretty easily, shouldn't we? That's, that seems to me, and I've got a test to get back in. So, I mean, you'll, you'll know, I mean, not with certainty, because I could potentially catch it in my last 48 hours here. But Tom, on your point, why on the borders wouldn't we say, look, you've got to have a reliable test. But if, you know, within the last 48, 72 hours, you've tested negative, that will do for us. There is a chance that you've caught it on the plane or whatever. There's a chance, but not much of a chance. You're probably in the clear. If you haven't got a test document with you, you're not coming in come hell or high water. Yeah, yeah this is the problem with the incubation period of the virus. Obviously, the, the test that you take will not tell you anything about the last 48 hours. It will tell you um, stuff before then. And of course, you might have caught it in between. And what Australia does is say that when you arrive there, you can cur curtail your quarantine if you test negative whilst you're in their facilities. And I think that there are certain things we can do for British nationals. Obviously, this is a massive imposition on um, freeborn uh, people of the United Kingdom to, to come back to their own country. So I think there is a, a case for the United Kingdom um, taxpayer taking on that uh, burden, for, particularly for those who, who potentially can't afford their own quarantine in hotels. But really, is it that much to ask to spend three days or four days in a hotel just to make sure we're not importing something that will curtail the liberty of everyone else in this country by a far greater degree than that one person for a few days? Don't, Tom, you're making me feel guilty that I'm in Tenerife and I've absolutely promised myself not to feel guilty about it. I got out legally, I'm here legally, I'm exercising my free democratic rights. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Keep up the great work at the Guido Forks website. Keep digging around and asking people what their actual definition of a key worker is, because when you dig under the skin, you're right, it includes retrobates like Tom Harwood and members of parliament. You see, he's, you know, he's landed himself in it by exposing this policy. Tom, lovely to see you as ever. Thanks so much for joining us, especially at such short notice. Always lovely to have you. See you soon, I hope, my friend. Uh, we've got two other guests. Um, Joining us just now, uh, Joanna Williams, who is the co-founder and director of the new think tank, Keo, and uh, welcome back onto the show to her, and um, Brendan Chilton, um, who is the chief executive of the Independent Business Network, uh, a big voice uh, back in the day in the Labour Leave campaign, and um, uh, a Labour Party councillor in Ashford, Kent. Uh, good evening to both of you. Good evening, Joanna. Good evening, Brendan. Lovely good to evening. see you again. Uh, Brendan, I, I suppose I should start with you. I should give, um, I, I don't think you're an official spokesman for, Ke for Sir Keir Starmer, <laughs> but the, you're the closest I've got on the show tonight. So um, uh, I don't know if you heard, Tom, and you've seen um, Guido's coverage about the, the Labour Party suggesting we roll out kind of key workers once we've got through the age demographic, and um, Tom discovering that the key workers would include the um, Labour Parliamentary Party, and indeed probably reporters from the Guido Fawkes website, if journalists were included <laughs> as well. Uh, what's your take on this? It looks like a bit of a clumsy mit misstep by the official opposition, isn't it? Yes, and I think uh, the difficulty you've obviously got is, you know, who is a key worker? What is a key worker? It's entirely subjective. I can totally understand uh, the idea behind uh, the the argument you know we all want to get to a position where our schools our businesses our public bodies everything's open and back to normal as soon as possible um however to start ranking people as to whether how key they are and how crucial they are i mean who's going to make that decision uh, is it for politicians to do um so yeah this has been a, a minor um issue the, the labor party didn't quite realize that it would mean the mps and great journalists like Tom uh, would also be included in this. Um, the key thing here is the government just are doing reasonably well on getting the vaccine out. Let's give them credit. We just need to speed it up even more. I think we should be using all sorts of innovative uh, techniques to get this done. Why can't we use schools? Why can't we use empty parish halls in little villages to speed this up? Um, the sooner we can get this done, the sooner we can get back to normal and the sooner our economy uh, can start growing again. And by God, does it need to start growing again quickly? Sure does. Sure does. Uh, Joanna, where, where are you on this vaccine rollout? And then I, I want to move on to the, the sort of slight confusion in policy about whether schools are opening, but you've got to stay at hotels or whatever. Um, the, the UK does seem to be doing well uh, by international standards, but we, it's possible that we're only remarkable owing to the flatness of the surrounding landscape, right? I mean, 
beating France doesn't seem to be particularly difficult, really, right? You only need a handful of nurses and a few needles and you can beat France. Um, but how would you, what, what's your audit, Joanna, of how the, the rollout program's been going? And on Brendan's point, are there innovative ways where we could scale this up, double the numbers? And crucially, sort of, which does go to this Labour Party intervention today, you know, who comes next? You know, once we've it's kind of pretty obvious you're going to do the over 80s and then the over 75s, then the over 70s. But once you're getting down to people in our rough age range, you know, who, who goes first out of the four of us? What's your what's your solution there, Joanna? Mm -hmm. Well, I do think uh, that this is a huge success story. And I do think this is one of the very, very few things the government's got right over the course of the past year. And they do deserve praise for that. Uh, certainly as a Brexit voter, I've been more delighted than ever uh, that we made that decision to leave the EU over the past few weeks. And when you see the mess that uh, the EU have got themselves into trying to uh, negotiate on behalf of 27 countries and uh, failing miserably, I, I say quite regretfully and in the spirit of international friendship, um, but I think it's a really important question that you raised, Mark, about the order of priorities. And it seems to me, well, I'm, I'm personally very torn on this issue. It seems to me there are two ways we could look at it. One would be purely in terms of the risk to life and risk to health. And by that argument, there would be no reason whatsoever for prioritising teachers. Um, the ONS data that's been released this week shows that teachers uh, not only are at no more risk than members of the general population to um, becoming seriously ill or, or dying uh, from coronavirus, but are actually at substantially lower risk, uh, whether that's to do with the demographics of the people who are in teaching or to do with the nature of the job. I mean, I'm sure you're better um, protected and, and safer working in a school than you are working in, even in a supermarket and certainly than working in a care home or in a hospital. Um, but having said that, given how reluctant teaching unions and some teachers seem to be to return to the classroom, and given how desperate this situation is now for the nation's children, honestly, I think we need to do anything. Um, I saw somewhere the other day the statistic that said we could get the entire um, population of teachers um, I think that's a million or, or, or certainly half a million um, vaccinated in just one weekend. Now, I really am at a loss to understand as to why we're not doing that. Why not use the February half term and be generous, have more than a weekend, use the February half term to vaccinate every teacher, every teaching assistant, every dinner lady, every school secretary, every caretaker and get the schools back two weeks after that. And it just seems to me that that removes every excuse remaining for, for schools still being closed. Andy, let me come back to you on this kind of key worker thing, which, you know, uh, uh, key workers, essential workers always, always, you know, causes me to get on edge, really. I mean, let me give you a controversial example. You might think it's good for the nation as a whole to keep the English Premier League going, right? It's pretty much the only new stuff on television. It's very popular, although seeing Southampton lose to Arsenal last night was bloody miserable. Um, <laughs> you could, there's only, what, 600 Premier League footballers is hardly taking a big slice of the vaccine out. At the moment, they're having to be tested every bloody two days and then isolate or whatever, and quite a lot of players have missed games because of that. You could keep football running. I don't know whether people would see that as key, essential, certainly a very big nice to have for a lot of people while they're sitting at home with nothing to do and they've watched everything that's on Netflix, you know, click over to some live football. Andy, how do you think we should treat these competing needs? There's always obviously a tendency to say nurses, teachers, all the caring, sharing professions. That isn't actually a particularly smart way of doing it though, is it? Um, I think you'd be unsurprised um, that my answer would be it's a political choice. And the choice and what, how smart it is does, I'm afraid, come down to uh, the headlines that they are trying to avoid. I mean, it's clear there is, I mean, again, start with the NHS. That is everybody's priority in a pandemic. You don't want the key workers in the NHS to be taken out by the virus. Otherwise, the hospitals and all the other medical services will be overwhelmed. So that one seems to be fairly easy and uncontroversial. The case with the schools is more difficult, but not really. I mean, you're causing an enormous amount of popularity if you go down that route. 
um, parents do not universally love having their pride and joy at home 24 seven while they themselves are trying to work on Zoom, particularly if they're primary age and are incapable of looking after themselves much of the day. So if you wanted to go down that route, you'd probably be having a bit of a win there for the government or for the opposition by recommending it. Uh, the one rejoins that is it wouldn't just be enough to vaccinate the teachers, the teaching assistants and all the other people working in the schools. You've got to then vaccinate their families as well. Otherwise, at the margins, at least, you're not going to get the full impact. OK, well, let's uh, let's consider now about how we might bounce back, getting schools open again and the, the like of it. Um, Brendan, you were saying a few moments ago, you know, at some point we've actually got to get the economy moving again. You can't put it in the deep freeze forever. Let, let me tell you my broad theory here. I'm not a scientist. Happy to be told by scientists I'm wrong. But we should be able to plot a trajectory now and staging posts at which various things can happen, right? Once we've, um, if you like, fortunately in some ways, because the virus is so ageist, uh, once you've done the, the vulnerable people, you're, you're going to, you know, see a, not a proportionate but a massively disproportionate, thank God, drop in the death rate. Why can't we sort of say even if you accept we're going to be stuck at 300,000 vaccines a day and they're not going to do anything innovative to increase that, let's just treat that as an act of God, couldn't we plot various now points on the calendar going forward where we could say, as long as we keep that 300,000 a day, then on such and such a date, the schools will reopen, you know, a week later, the restaurants will reopen for social distance gathering, three weeks after that, the pubs will open, Four weeks after that, we'll scrap all of the coronavirus restrictions altogether. Seems to me you should be able to basically plot this now. Obviously, if it turns out the vaccine doesn't work or there's some black swan event, we're back to square one. But we've got enough knowledge to get this roadmap out, haven't we? I would have thought so. And you would have thought as well, as, as you go along that, that route you suggested there, Mark, of a, a plot to the future that actually you find it speeds up and you know the curve becomes more straight towards the end so as more and more people get vaccinated we're out much quicker i think the problem is at the moment we've got very much a top down you know rollout of this vaccine i mean i i, I just was thinking the other day you know in 1940 the uh Churchill Attlee coalition government managed to get 300,000 soldiers off of a beach back to the UK by enlisting an army of volunteers to sail across and get it. Um, why aren't we ensuring that every school nurse, for example, is in charge of vaccinating the school? And most schools still have a nurse attached to it and the parent community. Similarly, in care homes, why aren't the nurses attached to those being charged with getting it out? Let's just get it done, for heaven's sake. We've been innovative in the past. I think your point, though, on having this trajectory of when we can get out of these measures is absolutely vital. And your point on home education is very prevalent. I've had uh, meetings with some residents today via Zoom in my own ward who are really struggling at the moment to educate their children. And one parent said to me, I I'm going to be direct with you, Brendan. I haven't educated my child this week. I've just not been able to do it. Uh, when you've got three children, you're trying to work, you're trying to keep the house running. And especially when they're in the kindergarten years, as you uh, just mentioned, it, it is impossible. Um, the other thing as well uh, that this for me is very important is that this never it doesn't become a, a constant lockdown. You know, we're, we're already hearing messages from government that, oh, the country's a bit too fat and so they're at risk. And so we, we can't necessarily unlock soon. You mentioned the idea of uh, what the Home Secretary said, you need a bit of paper to get in and out of the country. Uh, I was listening to your discussion with Tom. We need a timescale, not just for when the economy opens up, but for when the freedoms that we all regarded as normal um, can return as well. Um, because we don't want to continue to drift down an increasingly sort of authoritarian and controlling route. This this country is not made like that. We're, we're, we're here to be free. We're an example to the world. So attached to an economic recovery, we've got to have a restoration of liberty as well. Joanna, uh, how, how are you feeling about that? Do you think, um, I mean, you've been on the show before. I think you and I would have taken a more liberal approach to, to uh, lockdown. Um, but do you think, even if we're on a slower trajectory than you and I would like, that that trajectory does, within a reasonable time frame, get us back to the sort of freedoms we took for granted in February 2020? Or is Absolutely. there a danger that a load of this stuff will stay, you know, that let's, oh, just in case, let's keep this, that or the other. And, you know, because 
it will stop people spreading the common cold or standard influenza or whatever? Or do you think, you know, sooner or later, by the spring, maybe the summer at the latest, we'll be over all of this, the coronavirus restrictions will have gone and we'll be back to the freedoms that we took for granted this time last year? Well, I certainly hope it's the latter, but my fear is the former. My fear is exactly as Brendan was saying, that we're, we're kind of trapped in the forever lockdown where we, we kind of maybe get released for um, short periods of time and then we find another excuse. You know, we need a climate crisis lockdown or we need an obesity crisis lockdown. But I think the points you're making, Mark, about actually having a roadmap um, and, uh, and actually plotting a trajectory. I think those are so important now um, for the nation's collective mental health. Um, I think a number of people ho have said to me personally, but also more publicly, just how much harder psychologically this lockdown is than previous lockdowns. We can point to the weather, we can point to the, the darkness, but I think one key factor in that for me is not having a deadline, not knowing when this will end. And even though we've got the vaccine on the horizon, we don't don't seem to be any clearer about how long we have to stay living like this for. I actually think it was really quite shameful of Boris Johnson to stand up in Parliament today and say that he hopes schools will start reopening on the 8th of March. He said, hopefully, this is what will happen. And that kind of suggests that this is something which is outside of his control. I mean, he's the prime minister for crying out loud. You know, it, he has it within his power to declare that schools will reopen on the 8th of March. And actually, he should be apologising to the nation for the fact that it's taking so long, never mind expressing his, his hopes. One thing I actually disagree a little bit with, Andy, I'm afraid, you know, this is not about parents and this is not about popularity. My daughter's a teenager. She's 14. This is about her. It's not about how I might happen to be feeling about this or whether I'm a little bit stressed because I'm having to juggle her presence whilst I'm working from home. It's about the sheer relentlessness of her being isolated as a teenager, living in Kent for two months now without seeing friends, without seeing anyone her own age, of having to wake up at the age of 14 and sit in front of a laptop for six hours a day, every day, with no change, nothing. I mean, that is a terrible, terrible thing to do to 14 year olds. Forget the feelings of parents, forget how popular Boris May or may not be with me right now. You know, this is about the children and this is about the fact that they are really, really struggling with this. So Andy, you, you sort of, I wouldn't go so far as say implied, you alluded to the fact that your daughter might be sending you around the bend, but you're probably sending her around the bend as well, right? I think uh, John and I probably agree more than she thinks. I mean, the, all the points you made are, are completely correct, but you can't ignore the psychological aspects of uh, messaging and how the government is managing the crisis. Um, certainly, it's the case that children are reacting to this in different ways. Um, we are relatively lucky. Our daughter seems to enjoy living her life on Zoom and other social media platforms with her friends and has a lively social life despite being locked down. I mean, it feels weird and things are not right. And I think Brendan did make some crucial points there about the importance of celebrating our freedoms and reminding people that those are what matters in terms of the way the government's acting. I mean, there is a psychological theory called reactance, which says that in any situation where a authority expresses a very controlling view, so it says essentially obey, you, know, you must save the NHS, this is the thing that matters and spreads fear and terror, there is always a small proportion of the population that will then react to that far more negatively than is even rational. So they will act against their own interests in order to react to the very bad messaging by the government. So the solution to that, and this has been tested in health messaging in particular, is that what the government could be doing, saying we are doing this in order to restore normality, in order to bring your freedom back. And if they did that, they would be bringing along some of the people that are currently being criticised, like by, for example, Neil O'Brien, um, with them, rather than creating this artificial, uh, we are here being the sensible saying government and you're over there and you're all nutters. Um, that's not being good. That's encouraging a level of division around this that doesn't need to be there. Yeah, but the, the I mean, you remember at the, the start of this uh, nightmare a year ago, there was a whole discussion about herd immunity and sort of one strategy 
uh, and I think it's even verboten to discuss it, was that you would, you know, I can remember when I was a kid, you know, it's desperate urgent, uh, urgency on my parents to make sure I got mumps as a kid, because it's, you know, it's terrible if you get it post puberty, that you'd have these sort of, you know, parties in which young people try and get COVID to get it over with. And before you know it, we'd be, I think the initial number bounced around was 60% was what's needed for herd immunity. I know that's not considered to be an absolute definitive number. Maybe it's a little higher than that. But uh, hell's teeth, we've had, what, 10% of people, roughly speaking, in Britain have probably had this already. We've now um, vaccinated more than 10%. Uh, there'll be a little bit of overlap there. Um, but we're, that's 20% done. Once we've got to herd immunity, surely in terms of my trajectory and mileposts, that's it, right? That's got everything can be completely relaxed now. Doesn't matter if there's a handful of anti-vaxxers who don't want to take it, because as soon as we get to 70%, we're done. We, we, we don't need to worry too much about um, the relatively small handful of people who won't take it for religious reasons or conspiracy reasons or, or whatever. Do you think, Brendan, that although uh, I certainly would have done, I think you were as well, taken a more liberalised approach to this lockdown now, it's just put the foot to the floor, get to that 60% herd immunity mark, or if the experts say it's 70%, fine, whatever the bloody number is, foot to the floor, get to that number, and then bang, everything's open back to normal. I, I totally agree, Mark, and I, I'd go one further. I'd, I'd say as soon as those, the, the, those that are in the most vulnerable categories are done, we should be getting to that point. But the, the worrying thing is, it was I think it was the Prime Minister's uh, broadcast about a week ago, um, he actually said that we cannot consider, and I've got the quote here in front of me, so this is verbatim, we cannot consider unlocking until we know that there are no new variants of the coronavirus. Now, I, I'm not a scientist, but as I understand it, a virus, by its very nature, mutates. It's what it does. Uh, the cold mutates every year. That's why we all get one. Uh, similarly, with the flu, with the flu. Um, so this thing that we're all living with at the moment is going to do just that, unless I'm very wrong. Um, and Professor Whitty uh, said that in the winter, the winter at the end of this year, uh, we may have to consider reintroducing uh, some of these measures, and that there'll have to be a sort of annual vaccine similar to the flu vaccine. So. Potentially here, the nation has unknowingly signed up to a, an annual lockdown. It's a little bit like the Hunger Games. Instead of all going out massacring one another, we're all being locked up for periods of time. Um, and this, to me, is, is very worrying because there's no democratic mandate for this. Not one of these policies uh, that we're all being forced to live under at the moment has any democratic mandate at all. And I think if the government are suggesting this should happen, um, that there needs to be some way in which the people uh, can express their view on it. Um, because if this is to be part of our lifetime forever, it's going to have catastrophic uh, consequences for the economy on an annual basis. Uh, it's going to have catastrophic consequences on the public health, particularly mental health of the population uh, in perpetuity. And of course, our national debt uh, will never really ever come down because we'll have to be borrowing and borrowing every other month or every few years uh, while we adapt to a new strain of this virus. So there are really quite long term issues that we've got to consider here uh, politically and as a society as to what we're prepared to tolerate. Uh, yeah, and like I, you, I'd say, I, we need to get back as, as soon as possible. But I fear this is going to carry on and on and on. So, Joanna, here's, here's the nightmare about it carrying on and on and on, right? Let me paint that, you know, the worst of all worlds. It's not just that, you know, there might be, there's bound to be more mutant variants of all of this thing. That's the way it is. I'm kind of assuming, again, I'm no scientist, that actually we will have to vaccinate everybody every year for the rest of eternity. Obviously, year one's the hardest. You had to invent the vaccine. My limited scientific knowledge is such that, it's easier to then adapt it and presumably we'll find a, a, some sort of administrative system for rollout. It's harder in year one, but I'm assuming we'll have to do it again in 2022. But here's a couple of things to, to worry you and get paranoid about, Joanna. I read in the Evening Standard, uh, I think it was yesterday's Evening Standard, this worry about disease X. This doesn't actually exist, but it's the concept that there might be some other pandemic at some point in the future and or it may already be with us it's just we haven't detected it yet and you can't be too careful you know there's there would be one argument or another one how about this we've got to hit carbon net zero in uh, before too long the consequence of this lockdown has moved us towards lower carbon emissions funny that isn't it uh, given nobody's traveling working or doing anything but it hasn't moved us enough so to save the planet we should keep people in lockdown 
lockdown. Do you think, Joanna, there could be, I've given some extreme examples there, but kind of a massive moving of the goalposts such that a good element of these state controls remain in place, even if we can say goodbye to COVID-19? Absolutely. I mean, this is very, very much my fear, but I, I think you really don't need to go as extreme as the examples that you've given there, Mark. I mean, to me, I think the uh, fanatical pursuit of zero COVID, which a number of people seem to be um, thinking is the right course of action um, to pursue right now, would in and of itself render us in lockdown forever. Because as Brendan points out, you know, there will always be new variations coming in from, from uh, discovered in countries around the world. There will be the virus mutating here or by itself. Um, and I think the thing that, that precisely because as Brendan says, you know, this hasn't been subject to a democratic process, what we've never had as a country and, and it's becoming day by day increasingly more difficult to have is an adult conversation about risk. Precisely what risks are we prepared to take? What, what are we prepared to sacrifice? So when you're saying about the vaccine to be rolled out annually, um, clearly at the moment, uh, flu is a very, very serious um, illness for many people in the population and, and kills many people tragically every year. Flu vaccines are not compulsory. We've never talked about having flu vaccine passports. Um, we've never talked about having mass, um, you know, kind of bringing in everybody we can think of and every public institution to vaccine people against flu. We have awareness raising campaigns. We strongly advise uh, more vulnerable people to get the flu vaccine. But we also understand that you take your chances. You know, I might some years, if I'm feeling particularly vulnerable, go and pay and get a jab. Some years I, I've got to confess I don't just because I don't feel particularly any need to. And I think we will need to get to that point in relation to coronavirus where we are advising vulnerable people, we're suggesting it, we're making it available, but we also need to allow people to take risks proportional to their own lives, the people who they mix with, and, and their own individual decision-making process. Uh, and if we pursue um, zero COVID, which I know um, Diane Abbott's heading up a group on behalf of the Labour Party, there's people in the Green Party, people in the SNP, really pushing for this um, zero COVID strategy, uh, we, will, we will be in lockdown forever of one sort or another. We will never ever um, reclaim all our freedom. Uh, and, you know, I'll just finally mark on the broader points that you're making. I think one thing that this past year has really shown to me is the problems with this culture of safetyism, a culture where we um, see risk in everything and we completely change every facet of our lives around mitigating against um, viral risks like this and, and just how completely incapacitating that is for maintaining any kind of social, public, economic um, kind of life. Um, Andy, uh, I know we've got to let you go soon, but give us some reasons to cheer up a bit. How can we pilot our way out of this? Um, uh, we had on this channel last night a, a, a long discussion with Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, he did cheer me up a bit to suggest that, um, uh, that uh, we, there was a need and he was committed and the government was committed to the complete return of people's freedoms when that was possible. I mean, you know, I wish he was a bit faster about it. But our great philosophical guru at the IEA, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, you know, always warned crises, you see state power enhanced, um, possibly necessary for the, you know, for the purposes of defeating Nazi Germany. But by God, the state doesn't relinquish the powers as readily as it grabs them. Uh, the example I gave Jacob was that there was, uh, I think it was 1951 before national ID cards were abolished in the United Kingdom. Well, there weren't too many Nazi infiltrators between 1945 and 1951. It wasn't really a problem that national ID cards were going to solve. Jacob even conceded, I think he said, that there were some, some price controls that were kept on as late as the 1960s or the 1970s that were brought in um, only to deal with the Nazi menace. Andy, was Hayek right, in which case we've got a lot of reasons to um, uh, be pessimistic about the future, or what's the best way of getting a snap back to freedom as quickly as possible, even if we argue about what exactly that trajectory is, surely to God we can actually agree what the destination is, even if we disagree on the trajectory. So uh, the main reason to be optimistic is the vaccine programme is rolling out a heck of a lot faster than most of us thought was possible. And if we're up to 7 million today, I think that's about the right number, 
and we've got a population of around 66 and a half million, it's not beyond the wit to assume that we will reach that magic 60 or 70 percent herd immunity level um, at about the right sort of time for ending the lockdown, maybe towards summer. I and mean, I don't believe the government is going to leave it just at March. So there's some reasons to be cheerful there. Um, Hayek is both right and wrong in this. I mean, the government will introduce measures in this pandemic that will persist. I don't think we're really looking at the risk of permanent lockdown. I think the risk there is more psychological. I think for some people, the fear of going back out at the end of this, whether they're vaccinated or not, is going to be quite high. There'll be a small minority, but they will be there. And this will have had a profound impact on them. And they're the kind of people who were describe themselves as germ aware prior to this pandemic. Um, but for most of the rest of us, I think we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, even if the government can't bring itself to say so. So we will see a restoration of the economy. A lot of the people who have tried to use this pandemic, for example, on the climate change issue, for which, say, the mayor of London is one, well, they're doing that for quite cynical reasons. I mean, Sadiq Khan introduced his special measures on the roads across London at a time when he was seeking re-election and his election got postponed a year, so he's persisted. But now he's losing cases in the courts and some of these schemes have been proven illegal. He's probably likely to shift on that. I mean, a little bit of resilience at the moment, but that's going to come, come around. So I think we will, we will see some nonsense, but people are going to become increasingly intolerant of it. So where Hayek is right is that these are not static situations. They're dynamic and public opinion will move and will change as we get towards that light at the end of the tunnel. OK, you cheered me up a bit, Andy. Lovely to have you for your first time on the show. Um, I was going to say see you soon, but I'll only be seeing you on Zoom or Teams meetings or whatever. And just to confirm to our audience, that, that isn't a green, street, green screen backdrop that Andy's got. He, he really does live in a, in a 15th century mansion or something like that. I think it is, isn't it, Andy? Um, but um, thanks for joining us. See you soon, Joanna and Brendan. Uh, stay with us, Brendan. I know you've got to go in just a few minutes time. I want to move on to another topic. But before I do so, just a couple of advertisements. We've mentioned schooling. Um, uh, I appreciate if you've got young kids, they're probably not yet uh, being taught economics, but if you've got slightly older kids or you think they might want to do A-level economics, uh, we've got a great series of tools for you that we launched just this week, our Econ 101 series. It's a series of 18 uh, short explainer films covering everything from basic economic theory to important case studies. They're a great aid to revision. If you do have someone doing economics A-level, or perhaps you'd like to do economics A-level yourself to provide a good grounding economics, they're all free of charge on the IEA London YouTube channel. So check those out and please watch them or share them with people who you think might be interested in it. It's a great, it will only take you to watch the whole lot about um, uh, three hours or so and give you a great grounding in economics. I reckon you can ace an A-level if you watch all of those. And then competition time. My uh, single-handed effort to get the economy stimulated is to offer 50 quid of my hard-earned cash every week. Um, yeah, I know it's not the sort of level being thrown around by Rishi Sunak, but, you know, every little bit counts. Uh, last week, our question was, in terms of US presidential elections, in what way is Virginia ahead of Ohio? In terms of US presidential elections, in what way is Virginia ahead of Ohio? And I think the tiebreaker was by how much. Loads of interesting answers. Some of them are actually explanations. I think Peter Gill in particular of ways in which Virginia was ahead of Ohio, but nobody got exactly the thing I was looking for. Virginia has the most number of native sons who've gone on to become president of the United States, eight of them, Ohio in second place with seven. That was the answer we were looking for. Because none of you get it, my 50 quid cannot stimulate the economy. So, you know, try and answer the question better um, uh, this week as well. And uh, this week's question is uh, a bit of a bit of a strange one, um, but um, I don't know if any of you get it. There might even I try to get quiz questions that people can't can't cheat about. But the the question this time round, an image is going to appear on the screen, and the question will be: What is absolutely remarkable about the two people in this image? That's going to be the question this time round. If you see that image and you think you know the answer then uh, make sure that you email your answer to lwl at iea.org.uk and I'll, I'll make sure our guys put that image on the screen for you on the YouTube chat soon. Want to move the discussion on, and Brendan, I know we're going to be losing you shortly, onto um, poverty. 
Oxfam, poor thinking. That's what we're um, uh, uh, accusing them of. Uh, the IA has been this week. Every year, Oxfam comes up with its inequality um, report, usually saying that the top 10, 12 billionaires in the world have more money than the bottom 50% put together. Uh, we rigorously go through this report and, 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 and highlight all of the misnomers in it. Oxfam say that there's a rigged economy, a super rich elite, um, that uh, there should be a temporary tax on excess profits made by the 32 global corporations who've gained the most in recent years. Some of that might sound pretty reasonable, but I think they're also advocating a £100,000 a year maximum wage. Um, this is pretty uh, hardcore. Uh, and it's all about wealth redistribution. Um, it's they, Oxfam never say anything anymore about um, producing wealth, creating wealth. Um, my sort of challenge to Oxfam is join the IEA in arguing for global free trade, a removal of trade barriers, the establishment of property rights in parts of the world that don't have them, and an adequate rule of law in poorer parts of the country. Um, uh, Brendan, how do you feel about this? You know, you're, you're a Labour man. I mean, I, I don't want to do down Oxfam too much. Over the years, they've done some good stuff, but they seem to have become more and more of a kind of socialist campaigning outfit. Or as I said at the outset, an organisation that used to worry about how many poor people there are in the world and now seem to worry about how many rich people there are in the world. Well, well, as a social democrat and not as a socialist, uh, I accept and believe that you do need as free a market as possible so you can have the kind of growth you're talking about. Uh, one of the great mistakes, many people working in the sort of charity development sector and many in my own party make is we focus far too much on redistribution. Of course, I believe you need an element of it because there will always unfortunately be people in society for whatever reason uh, can't get on and need a helping hand. So I'm I believe you need that. But to constantly chastise those who create the wealth, uh, the innovators and the entrepreneurs who create the jobs which enable government to tax them to pay for these nice public services that we all enjoy, we should not be chastising them. Uh, on the contrary, at the moment, we should be letting them off the leash uh, and lifting all these terrible restrictions that we have. Uh, most people in this country em employed in the private sector are employed in small family owned and family run businesses. And uh, certainly all of those small businesses at the moment, they, they don't start their business with a view to, oh, I'd just like to stay small. They all want to be big. They all want to be huge and make a load of money. And that's perfectly fine. And in the Labour Party's past, someone did once say we're perfectly comfortable with people being stinkingly rich. And we should be because everybody would like to be. Um, the truth is we can't all be. Um, so I, I totally agree. I think Oxfam have done some great work over the years. But in terms of pushing for an agenda that just says, oh, we must tax more oh, we must take money off people more and redistribute more. No, there needs to be a much greater focus on growing the economy and generating the wealth we need to provide jobs and hope for people. There you go. You've almost converted me to being a social democrat, Brendan. I'll Thanks send you a business. membership. <laughs> I'll send you a membership form. <laughs> I don't think I disagree with any of that. Brendan, I know you need to leave us. You said you needed to leave at seven. Sorry to have kept you on a little longer Not than at that. all. Not at Always all. lovely to see you, Joanna. Stay with us. And I'm going to bring in two other guests to uh, discuss this as well. We're joined by... Um, Jamie White, classical liberal author, public intellectual, sometime politician, former research director here at the IEA, of course, and has um, uh, gone into battle shoulder to shoulder with me on this Oxfam stuff. And John Ashmore from CapEx uh, uh, as well, the, the website that uh, popularizes arguments for free markets and capitalism. So uh, a very good evening uh, to you two gentlemen. Lovely to... Um, have you with us. Um, I'll, I'll be asking your thoughts shortly about this, but uh, Joanna, let me come back to you. What's the, um, uh, what's the, your take on this sort of Oxfam report or this meme that now seems to appear that the biggest problem in the world is we have too many billionaires. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be the, you know, whereas, you know, I want more billionaires. I'd like everybody to be a billionaire for crying out loud. And you know, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos are not rich because they've exploited the poorest parts of the developing world. You know, that's not how they became rich. Actually, what they've done and brought could in, in some ways assist the, 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 the developing world. Why have anti-poverty charities gone down this rabbit hole, Joanna? Well, I completely agree with you that they certainly focus a lot more on the rich than they do on the poor nowadays. And uh, we can only assume that that's because it's easier and it makes for good political uh, point scoring. But I think um, 
you know, it, this is kind of nauseous. It makes, it makes you know, it's really kind of quite a bad line to go down in any year, but particularly in this year of pandemic, um, unless. Oxfam have been out there every day demanding an end to lockdown restriction so that people can go to work, so that shops can be open. I really don't think they're in any position to take the moral high ground when uh, chastising billionaires, because quite frankly, if you shut all your local shops, then you leave people with very little option other than to use Amazon, to go to the four main supermarkets, to uh, do all their shopping online. You know, there's lots of people who would actually quite like, I would quite like to be able to go down my high street here in Canterbury and to be able to go to all the local shops that choice has been taken away from me I'm no longer able to do that and the people who own those shops perhaps some people who've set them up as family businesses have built, been building them up over years are not able to sell me those products so yeah hands up you know I'm an Amazon user not proud of it but I do that because I have no other option to get the things that I want um, so I think unless Oxfam have been out there and unless these other charities have been out there day after day saying end the lockdown now, this is economically crippling um, large sections of the population, it's particularly crippling working class people, it's driving social class inequalities further apart, then they have absolutely no right whatsoever uh, to preach about billionaires having even more money than they had this time last year. I'm an Amazon user and proud of it. I hate shops. Absolute waste <laughs> of decent real estate. Convert them into wine bars or something. Um, um, uh, anyway, Jamie, uh, good evening to you. John, good evening to you. I can now see you both. Uh, if you take yourself off, uh, uh, off mute, that would be terrific. Jamie, perhaps I can come to you because you've gone into battle on behalf of the IA uh, against Oxfam on, on, on this sort of stuff before. What do you make of this sort of argument that they, I mean, it comes forward in one form or other every year now from Oxfam. You know, if only we took a little bit of money, just a little bit of a slice of Bill Gates and Facebook and I think, yeah, you know, I mean, then, then, you know, world poverty could be solved. What, what do we make of this? How should we respond? To this? <laughs> I mean, one of the things I enjoy about, um, you know, I, I used to write about bad logic and things. And one of the things I always really enjoy about the publication of this report is the the stupidity you see in it. It's great material. Um, for example, that this year they've said, um, because of the crisis, of course, the pandemic, they've said, you know, that these billionaires have got so much money that uh, they could pay for the entire um, vaccination program for the entire world. Well, it's an amazing point, isn't it? I mean, Bill what? Gates practically is, isn't he? Anyway, you know? <laughs> well, I was, well, but I was really disappointed by their report because I wanted to know if you uh, got all their money in the form of twenty pound notes and laid it on the ground, how many football pitches would it be, and how many times the size of Wales would it be? I mean, these are the economic insights that I need to understand what's going on in the world. I mean, it's just a farce. I mean, one of the funny ideas that they have is that you can just take money off people. You say, we're gonna take your money off you. And that will have no uh, other effect. I mean, the money will still be there. It won't change economic output in any way. Uh, it's just kind of there. And you simply grab it and hand it around. I mean, this is, I don't, you know, it's so stupid that it's astonishing that they're uh, willing to publish it. I mean, it's also immoral. It's so, so odd. I mean. They say things like, uh, these people can have, they've got the money, right? We, they've got the money that could cover this expense. Well, look, I've got enough money to cover your dinner bill, Mark. That's but, very kind know, of you. Thanks. <laughs> do you I therefore have a very have nice bike? restaurant this <laughs> evening as well. You couldn't have offered it a better time, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, I, I, I don't get it at all. I mean, it, look, here's the, th here's the deep issue I've Something has happened in the last 40 years, um, globalization, let's call it, which has had two effects. One is that it's created a lot more mega rich people uh, because their businesses have a scale. It's you know, astonishing, unprecedented in history. Footballers get so much money for the same reason, right? You know, viewers all around the world. That has created this hyper wealth. It's also lifted the poorest people around the world, or many of them, out of poverty. We've simultaneously seen 
the creation of this mega wealth and the, the, the great reduction in abject poverty. And they're connected. That's the same underlying process that's doing that work. And it's really weird of a charity apparently uh, concerned about the welfare of the poorest people to be hostile to that, to that underlying process. John, welcome, welcome to you. Welcome to the Hi. program. John, lovely to have you with us. What's your take on this? That the, you know, Oxfam, well, I know it's had its troubles in recent years to do with, you know, child abuse and the like, but generally speaking, people of their real seem to have the high moral ground and then they come in with this sort of easy solution, just take a little bit from Bill Gates and a little bit from here and a little bit from there and, and, and you know, no, no children will go hungry anymore. What, yeah. How should we dissect this and respond to it? Well, I agree with very much of a lot of what Jamie said about the, the sort of lack of analysis. My my take on it is that the first thing is that it's very, very well pitched for kind of glib social media sound bites, which is the kind of thing that these organisations are always looking for. So they can say something like, uh, you know, you know, billionaires could pay for the world's vaccines makes you think and loads of idiots will retweet them and share them and so on. So they'll get publicity by doing that kind of thing, possibly with an emotive video or whatever. The other thing I, I should stress, I have no insight into Oxfam's fundraising operation at all. I suspect they're trying to perhaps guilt trip some of these very rich people into making donations. Um, the other thing they might be trying to do is just to apply political pressure to uh, you know, politicians who might be minded to support the kind of policies that they come out with. And the, the key point I would make, and it's one that actually, I remember, I mean, Mark, you did an event on inequality a couple of years ago at the Tory conference with someone from uh, a charity who, whose name escapes me. And they were talking a lot about, and they kept coming back to the Democratic Republic of Congo being one of the world's poorest countries. And again, they were saying, oh, the you know, rich countries got all this money and Congo has got no money. And not once did they mention the fact that they've had a raging civil war for God knows how many years. And it's this, this lack of understanding of the causes of poverty as well as another complete lacuna in this report. It's as if it's just selfishness on the part of the rich world. Um, and, I, you know, there are structural problems. And there are problems with the trading system and stuff like that. But it, it's as if they've, they imagine a world that started completely fairly and it's only meanness um, on the part of the likes of us in the West that has, has led to this. And it's all just, uh, you know, it's like Jamie said, it's all just a bit infantile and not worth our time. Frankly. Joanna, let me come back to, to you. Do you think that it might be a reflection, however, that those of us who support free markets, free trade, the spread of capitalism across the globe, private property rights, sceptical about the state's ability to do much good and fear its uh, ability to do vast amounts of harm. Perhaps we have an articulated an anti-poverty agenda as much as we should, right? I mean, shouldn't we be putting some charter forward about ending the outrageous agricultural protectionism for rich white farmers in order to allow poorer uh, ethnic minority farmers to get their produce into our markets, for example, or the importance of setting up proper private property rights registration and proper governance in some of the countries? Uh, that are experiencing the worst sort of poverty. Is there a danger that people of our persuasion um, are, um, you know, have left this sort of field of battle some, somewhat, you know, we only engage in it every year when this Oxfam report comes out? I think there's some truth in that. I think what um, we fail to make the case for in particular is economic growth. And I think you see it even in, um, well, very high up in the Conservative Party, the very, very top of the Conservative Party. I think that you don't have to get that much into making the case for economic growth before it clashes with the environmental green agenda. And I think there becomes a certain amount of squeamishness. I mean, you could see it with a uh, debate around GM crops, for example, around nuclear power. So, I mean, I, I personally, um, you know, sorry to blaspheme, Mark, but forget free markets for a moment. I'd like to make the case for putting a nuclear power station in every country in Africa. You know, give, give Africa the entire continent free electricity. Why not? I mean, if we really wanted to think ambitiously... Jamie, for it. Jamie can yeah. pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, 
<laughs> but I mean, if we were really ambitious about wanting to tackle global profit, uh, poverty, you know, um, let's unleash the power of GM crops and agriculture. Let's unleash the um, power uh, well, nu of nuclear power for, for bringing about our food and, and abundant food and abundant um, power for the world. I mean, we, we could do this. This is within our, our capacity as a global society to be able to do things like this. But I think the problem is, I mean, whether you look at it at home or abroad, um, we cannot, it's a moral failing, I think, that we cannot make the case for growth, for economic growth, for any kind of growth. As soon as we um, meet the environmental lobby, then um, people kind of hold their hands up and get squeamish about making those arguments. But just in terms of, of Oxfam in particular, I think the other side of the coin there is I do wonder, just, just particularly listening to John there, whether um, there's a real squeamishness about um, their historic mission of a, a group like Oxfam, which was yeah. to to starving black babies, essentially, and to say, look, these poor starving Africans, these poor Africans, and they now feel embarrassed about doing that and following that agenda, rightly or wrongly. I mean, rightly, I, I happen to think, I, I think that was a, a shameful kind of neo-colonialist um, project that they were engaged in right from the very beginning. Um, but rather than just kind of backing, backing out and saying, we're going to fold up um, because we're embarrassed about our historical mission, um, they keep going, they keep their own salaries. And the only way they can justify it is rather than pointing at African people or black people, um, look at a handful of rich white male billionaires uh, becomes a very, very easy target for them to kind of get their moral rocks off on. Yeah, damn right, damn right. This is a battle that we engage in every year and need to win. Joanna, it's been lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. See you again Thank soon, you. I hope. Jamie and John, obviously, um, stay with us. Um, Jamie, what do you make of um, this, uh, that, that people of our inclination, a sort of libertarian or libertarian leaning or free market inclination, kind of, we just haven't really got the language or the narrative right here. Perhaps somebody, well, not necessarily the IEA, we're not a campaigning organisation, but Shouldn't there be a campaign for global free trade, not couched in here's a graph that shows it brings about economic growth, but, but um, kind of uh, based on very humanitarian concerns? It's been the spread of capitalism that's seen the absolute poverty rate drop. You know, we want these people to be, we want to end poverty, you know, by 2025, 20, 2030, 2040, pick a date. And we're going to do it by insisting on global free trade, property rights, enforcement of contracts, good rule of law everywhere in the world. Our side of the ledger just don't seem to engage in those sort of campaigns, fights or battles, really, do they? No. Well, I mean, I agree with all your recommendations. I think they're dead right. That's, that's what's needed. Um, I think the reason we don't engage in it so much is that we live in the West, most of us, and uh, rich countries. And the, the things that people care about in these countries are domestic primarily, and we, we get involved in those debates. And so, uh, you know, if you think about where the greatest, I mean, think about feminism, right? I often think about this with feminism. You, there are women in certain parts of the world are still treated abysmally. Abysm There's terrible sexism in some parts of the world. I mean, it's, it's awful. And yet Western feminists mainly concern themselves with things that strike most sane people as ridiculous trivia, right? But there and aren't enough women in Marvel Avengers movies. Exactly, you know? stuff like that, right? But, yeah, but yeah, yeah. there's serious trouble in other countries. And if you were, a, if you were genuinely concerned about the plight of women in the, in the world, you, you would, all your attention would be going to the, the atrocities that happen in, in countries like India and so on. And it's, but no, they don't, of course, because people are, inclined to you know, concentrate on their own, uh, their own homes. And I think there's a kind of, Joanna stated, I think we're kind of decadent. Um, you know, there are massive gains to be had from economic growth uh, for people who are now poor. If you were to increase the income of somebody uh, who now earns uh, 2,000 pounds a year to 3,000 pounds, that makes a massive difference in their welfare. Makes almost no difference to you to increase your income by a thousand. Massive there. And really that's what matters most. And that's what the kind of thing that Oxfam should be obsessed with. Um, 
and yet we, we are we, we kind of are concerned with all the crazy crap that you see in the papers in Britain these days and so on and nobody's thinking about the really big questions and what's odd to me is that the people who concern themselves so much with this really trivia in, in the western world are the people who uh, seem to believe themselves to be paragons of virtue mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i find it very perverse but but on the other hand very predictable uh, we're going to bring len shackleton uh i was going to say the ia's owned len shackleton but he's part ia part university of buckingham into the discussion so i'm going to ask the tech team to bring him onto the screen but, but john let me come back to you uh, from CapEx, your mission is to popularize um, free market um, pro-capitalist arguments. Uh, we'll make sure there's a link to CapEx shown uh, in the chat. If you're not <laughs> uh, you. a regular reader of it, then uh, make sure that you become a regular reader of it, sign up to their news bulletin. But what, what do you think we need to do better? Uh, all of us, but you know, you guys at CapEx, um, perhaps you know, right at the top of the list, in order to popularize <laughs> free market um, yeah. capitalist solutions. Well, something I say to contributors a lot of the time is, you know, have a good hook, tell a good story, because I think often some of the analysis and and perhaps this is a sort of trend for people on the right, they tend to be quite analytical people with good sort of processing approach to statistics and stuff like that. And they can kind of overload you with stats and, and, as you said, graphs, whereas often most people don't have the time to process that kind of information or maybe, you know, the inclination to. I think that that what left wingers, um, both in the media and in politics, are better at than conservatives is telling a compelling story with a bit of heart and a narrative. Whether it's true or not is a completely different thing. But most people don't have the attention span all the the time to take that in. Um, So I think that right wingers, liberals, whatever you know, label you want to affix to them, need to get better at telling human stories, such as you know the kind of thing like Jamie was describing about. Uh, you know, someone in a poor country added a thousand pounds to their income, what that could mean for them in terms of what they could do with their lives. And uh, charities, we were talking about Oxfam a lot, used to be really good at this kind of stuff. And you can imagine making a video about the benefits of, I don't know, someone getting a bicycle and being able to ride their bicycle to market, trade with other people, get richer. This is the kind of stuff, this should be, you know, meat and drink to people on the right. But it, But it's not. I think we spend too much time debunking nonsense from the left and not enough time telling our own very positive story about the world. And there's a great story to tell. So, you know, get, let's get on and tell it. Len, welcome. Welcome to you. Good evening. Um, Len, what's your take on the kind of, uh, you know, the poverty industry um, and the, this, this report from Oxfam that comes around once a year? But, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's standard fare often from those who, who say they wish to, you know, see the, the end to poverty. And it does sometimes feel that pushing water uphill for those who think that free market capitalism has some, most, perhaps even all of the answers in, in some of these cases don't get such a hearing. What do you put that down to and how should we fight back and win an intellectual case? Tell stories that are true. Well, there are, there are good stories to tell, aren't there? I mean, I mean it's interesting that, you know, they, they, they focus on these billionaires, a lot of, uh, who, uh, many of whom have, have made their money from uh, from the communications revolution, one way or another. I mean, if you think about mobile phones, for example, they've done far more for people in Africa than, than Oxfam will ever do. They've opened up the possibility of trading, of, of, you know, of, of people building up little businesses and so forth, of putting people in communication with their relatives and so on in a way which was impossible before. We were never going to put down enough landlines in Africa to, to you know, in, in any conceivable time frame. But the mobile phone has been revolutionary in Africa. And there are good stories like this which can be told. I mean, I, I, I you know, like you, I've been going on about Oxfam's annual report for, for a number of years. And they do go over this, you know, this same old ground all the time. And you're right, we should be so, we should be pushing back against this. The IA has done some quite good stuff about poverty, of course, in the past, the work that Christian Nemitz did and, and, and people like that and so on. And we should be bigging this up, I think, rather than simply being negative about her. Uh, about Oxfam. I mean, to be fair, you know, I know lots of people who, who, who work for Oxfam, who, who work for similar charities, and they're nice people, they're good people, but they're just, you know, they're on the wrong wavelength as far as sensible policy goes. That's the thing. Jamie, you know, the devil has all the best tunes. Do you think there's a, 
Um, I've, I've ruminated about this on this show and elsewhere before. Do you think there's a problem for us kind of free market liberals? We kind of always put a bit of a detached kind of meta case that, you know, get your property rights sorted in Botswana and, and have, you know, judges who aren't corrupt enforcing the law or contract and then innovation will kick in and things like mobile phones will be built before you know it, GDP will double. Whereas the, the, the easier, more intuitive answer is the more socialist answer. I mean, it might be naively stupid. It reminds me of, you know, when I was a kid around the dining room table refusing to finish my food and I say to my mum and dad, you know, why don't you just post it to the starving children in the world? And in some ways, you know, in some ways what the socialists are arguing is just a sort of, a, you know, is, is a colossal version of posting your leftovers to the starving people of the world. But, but it has a certain simplistic attraction, right? Whereas our arguments are much more structural that then lead to benefits, no? Well, you, I mean, that, that, that argument about um, food and, and the starving children in the world, I've used it myself many times, but with drink. If somebody won't finish their drink at a bar, I point out that there are sober people in the world. <laughs> this is completely wrong. How dare you when some people aren't drunk? That's to me, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we are. I, I think there's almost nothing we can do about this, unfortunately. So, if you tell a story, a very powerful story, it's always particular. It's not general. It's not structural. It tells you about this person and what happened to them and how it worked out. And the natural response to somebody who doesn't want to theorize, doesn't want to step back and theorize, is, "Oh, everybody should get that." Or you know, that, that there's this. Uh, the natural response to anything is is just a kind of emotional reaction that would prompt a parent, a parental response, right? And parents help their children through direct action. They do not help their children by creating a, a different set of laws or anything like that. So it really, the problem with storytelling, I, I mean, I take uh, John's point, and I think we can do a lot better at it. However, there's a problem with it, which is that it, it's kind of inherently authoritarian, but in, in terms of the response it prompts. And it, it just, we, I think we're at a disadvantage. Uh, you, you have to, and Milton Friedman was probably the best communicator of why our kinds of ideas are very humane and help people. And it was partly because he was a very humane guy was came through you could see he was a nice man he did that documentary um free to choose and he went around and he filmed people in hong kong let's say in in um what we would call sweatshops mainly you know in, but he showed that they were doing much better than they had been and that they were doing much better than people in china and i think maybe that's that's the way to go stories about how outrageous it is that somebody hasn't got what they wanted which is what the left does all the time uh, that tends to lead to the kind of conclusions that we don't like. So, I, I, you know, I think we need more Thomas Sowell's and Milton Friedman's and characters like that who can get our ideas across in a very straightforward way, in a compelling way. I, I, I don't think we're ever going to win the emotional game. Okay. Sorry. I'll um, just jump, jump in on that. I yeah, think John, maybe yeah. if I'd use the word illustrations rather than stories, then maybe we could. Right. Because I think that the Friedman, when you started talking about Friedman, I immediately thought of the Hong Kong video. And can, it's exactly can I, the kind of thing. Right. Can I come back in here? I, I mean, I've occasionally been asked to talk about what happened in New Zealand in the 1980s when we had a massive uh, liberalization economically. And one of the things that I... Um, I now do whenever I talk about this is I point out that the biggest transformation in New Zealand wasn't what you would call narrowly economic. It wasn't, you can't see it. I mean, the, the economic statistics are okay, but that misses the main point. When those liberalizations happened in New Zealand, the main change was cultural. There was an explosion of creativity, a kind of new energy, a new New Zealand stopped being the like bloody Aberdeen or something, some grim Presbyterian Scottish place to quite jolly, creative, outgoing place. The New Zealand that people know today is culturally, is the creation of those economic uh, reforms. And I, 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 so I think that another thing we can do is talk more broadly than just narrowly economic stuff. Sure. Um, I mean, for example, the COVID crisis, 
people talk about, oh, it's a trade-off between deaths and the, the economy. Eh. If you mean narrowly economic, that's wrong. It's a trade-off between deaths and almost everything else that people care about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So we need to get, I think we need to get a bit more like that. Um, and, and that will require stories because you can't do that in data. Yep. Okay. Well, John's right. um, I, I want to move on to our last topic because we're running behind schedule. But just before mm -hmm. that, I, I promised that I had 50 quid burning a hole in my pocket that I want <laughs> to be used to fiscally stimulate the economy. But if you were watching the slide earlier about how to win that 50 quid, there was a cunning device to keep that 50 quid in my back pocket. We gave you the wrong email address to uh, email the answer to. So uh, here it comes up now with the right email uh, address. The question is, what is remarkable about the two people uh, pictured in this photograph? Uh, if you know the answer, email it to lwl at iea.org.uk. It's got nothing to do with the topics we've discussed today, to give you a bit of a clue, but it's sort of got something to do with sort of technology and innovation. There's a little bit of a clue, and I hope that slide will be up on the screen shortly with the correct email address, lwl at iea.org.uk. What is so remarkable about the two people pictured here, um, and uh, let us know, and 50 quid could be yours. The terms and conditions are now in the notes at the bottom of YouTube. So uh, we're also on the right side of the law in me trying to give away 50 quid of my own money. Uh, the topic I want to finish on, we're calling Lost uh, Generations. Um, and it's a, a number of things coming together, which I, I think speak of uh, questions around inequality or intergenerational in, 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 inequity. Um, this week, unemployment rose to its highest level in five years. Hardly that surprising. Young people have been the hardest hit. Um, new figures show that poor white teenagers, uh, boys especially, I believe it is, in left behind areas of England are the least likely group to get to university. Uh, what does the future hold for them? Just to give you a few more statistics, proving how terrible I am at illustrating a story. I'm just going to machine gun you to death with data. Um, new data shows that unemployment was 5% um, uh, in Q3, according to the ONS, 418,000 more, more in the same period uh, than the previous year, biggest increase since 2009, quarter of a million fewer 16 to 24 year olds in employment before the pandemic, and I'm not sure entirely sure how this is judged, but those aged 25 to 34 face the biggest risk of losing their jobs as their redundancy rate has increased fivefold since the same time last year, more than any other age group. Meanwhile, of course, we're tackling a pandemic which is particularly horrific for the more elderly people. Young people are foregoing their freedom and their, their jobs in order to keep the elderly alive. Might be a trade-off that's well worth doing, but the burden is falling disproportionately on the young. Uh, we've still got a triple locked state pension. Uh, in April 2020, pensions increased by 3.9%, the same as earnings. In April 2021, we can uh, expect that the pension will increase by 2.5%, despite earnings falling by a percentage point and uh, CPI being at just plus 0.05. We seem to have baked in intergenerational unfairness into the system. Len, what do you make of that? Is, is the real division in society now from an economic point of view? not between black and white men and women, um, but uh, between the relatively older and the relatively younger. You always pick on me for this because I'm old. I've had my jab, actually. I had it last week, so I'm... I'm this, is yeah, the sort um, of, this is the sort of outrageous advantages that people of your age get, then. I'm appalled. I'm appalled. I know. So it's, privileged. It's so privileged. <laughs> No, I think the the the, the problems of of uh, young people are are, are are certainly very very serious indeed. Um, and uh, you know the government uh, doesn't really know what to do about it. Um, it's got this kickstart program, which was announced back in June, I think, uh, which was supposed to create three hundred and fifty thousand jobs, create jobs. Um, it's got two, uh, two thousand people signed up to it already, I believe. You know, so that's the that's, that's not working. Uh, we've got a skills white paper coming out, which is supposed to, uh, you know, that that'll that'll get them rocking as well. Um, you know, we we Boris announced uh, an apprenticeship scheme, which appears to have got lost. Nothing has happened about it since. 
And of course, the universities are, are in some kind of weird limbo at the moment. And don't even get me started about school kids because they've got two, uh, two at home who, uh, you know, who are, we've just been told today, March the 8th is now the earliest date before we're thinking of going back. Uh, so I think young people are getting a very rough deal here. Uh, as far as the, the the perks you were talking about, you know, the, the winter fuel allowance, I got mine 200 quid or something like that. The, the Christmas bonus, 10 pounds. Thank you, Sir Keith Joseph. That goes back 48 years. Uh, you know, there's all these kind of things, uh, <laughs> which I think don't make any sense at all. But of course, they're, they're, they're political poison to touch um, for, for the government. And, and to, so what they do instead, of course, is whack out similar things to other groups. I mean, another thing I've complained about in the past, and again, it's my kind of di a different part of my, uh, my my life, is the way in which we subsidize childcare now on a massive scale. You know, a couple of years ago, when my, my youngest was, uh, was in nursery, we suddenly got in effect a 3,000 a year gift from the government to keep the kid uh, for free in, in, in nursery for 15 hours a week, right? So uh, it's, this stuff is happening all over. And, and certainly, you know, as, as the IEA, we want to push for rational use of public money rather than this kind of just spreading out to, to all and sundry. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, let's, uh, let's take it away from, from older age groups, I think. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, I, I think the one that brought it home to me, if you want an illustration rather than a statistic, was uh, an IEA, uh, an elderly IEA supporter who said to me that he was extremely disappointed that he'd seen me on radio earlier that day arguing against the winter fuel allowance. And he said he very much liked receiving his winter fuel allowance because he put it towards heating his indoor swimming pool, not <laughs> suggesting to me that the winter fuel allowance was necessarily a brilliant poverty relief device in this particular <laughs> instance. Um, John, what's your take of this? That, that, the, that there seems to be two problems here. One, mm. you know, all of the rules are tilted towards the elderly. You might say that's a kind of feature of democratic electoral politics or the base of Conservative Party support. But then to Len's point as well, the way that it's evened up is, well, you know, if the state's doing a ton of stuff for the over 60s, the state should start doing a ton of stuff for the under 60s right. as well. And, uh, you know, that you, um, that, that's not a sustainable yeah, one. Yeah, I've got, I've got about six months until my government childcare bung comes in, so I don't want to jinx it. But um, <laughs> I, I wrote a column earlier this year, right, earlier last year, sorry, um, arguing against the triple lock. And I've never had so many responses, uh, emails from people who are furious that I should be suggesting this. Um, and some of them did make me think because there are people who, who are pensioners who you know, the main feature of being a pensioner is you have much, much less scope to improve or increase your income. So I get it from that point of view. I think the problem is, I mean, as you suggested with your example just there, we give way too much government money to well off pensioners in things like the winter fuel allowance. We, we just have too much universality in the welfare system in general. I mean, I, I see MPs, for example, sometimes trying to defend it and they say oh well we have to have universality and things like child benefit um although that has been slightly taken back now we have to have university universality so that there's buy-in i mean what does that even mean i mean to me it's a, in the long-term future the welfare state and the public finances in general is less sustainable because we give so much money away to people who don't need it um and i'm no there's no surprise to me that young people feel ripped off in in that context added to which no government seems to have the courage essentially to really go for the kind of changes in the planning system that would bring down house prices and which is the biggest cost for pretty much everyone um as far as covid's concerned i am i have a lot of sympathy for the, the plight of young people especially students and stuff but i think part of the stats you're seeing are just that the industries that have been hit by covid are the ones that tend to employ younger people i don't think there's any kind of mm. you know Grand conspiracy there or anything like that, but I, I hope that they will recover once things start to um, unlock a bit. So I'm a bit more positive there. Len, yeah. you want to come back in there? If I can. Sure, Len, go yeah, ahead. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the 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 figures of young people having lost their jobs uh, are, are not horrendous at the moment. But look at who's on furlough, right? Yeah. Over half of the five million or so people on furlough at the moment are in arts and entertainment, recreation food and accommodation. Um, these are overwhelmingly young people. 
And, you know, my fear is that when the plug is pulled on this, on the coronavirus job retention scheme, when it eventually is, uh, you're going to see possibly a million young people losing their jobs, I would, you know, at a rough guess, I would say. So I think that's something we really ought to uh, be concerned about. Jamie, what's your take on kind of generation wars? Um, I mean, it, it isn't a war at the moment. It's a sort of, it's a silent reality. I mean, I haven't seen loads of uh, under 40 year olds taking to the streets demanding that the triple lock ends or that the free bus passes are, are, are ended or all of the rest of it. But I wonder now if, if on things like the, the pensions triple lock, you, you could sort of say, well, look, we've done an awful lot to support the elderly, so we're not going to have that triple lock anymore and the money we're going to save is going to go to x you know i mean i'd like to get the total money spent by the government down but you could at least sort of move it in some i don't know we'll we won't charge employer of nic's on people under the age of 30 for some such like right and we're going to use this amount of money because people under the age of 30 have had their university screwed up you know they're on furlough we're going to give them a break do you think that would be palatable and do you think that it is now appropriate, Jamie, to see the big economic conflicts in the UK. We were talking about globally earlier, but it's this generational thing that really is the, the, the biggest unfairness, not really, you know, less so black versus white, men versus women, more, or, you know, over the age of 55 or under the age of 35. Right. Well, I agree that the system now is rigged in favour of the old in a variety of ways. And the most important way is through housing policy. So NIMBYism. Uh, which is in the interests of people who own property already, increase, you know, increases the value of their property all the time if you stop other people being able to build and live in, in new residential properties. That's the biggest problem for the young, and it's very clearly in the interests of the older, and that's happening. So I don't deny uh, the phenomenon. Are the young going to go out in the streets and riot and protest? N not to get rid of the benefits to the old, I don't think. Many of them don't even know they exist, but the people who might inform them they exist the, and, and rouse them to action, that the left, they don't believe that benefits should be taken away from the old, nor, by the way, does anyone in the mainstream right. They believe that benefits should be increased for the young. Um, so insofar as there's a plea for intergenerational equity, as we stupidly call it now, equality, um, it's going to just be for more government involvement in the economy, more redistribution of wealth, more of all that kind of thing. And so from a rhetorical point of view, banging on about this problem is not necessarily a great plan for, for us free marketeers, because the, insofar as people come to believe that there is a problem here, and I believe there is, they're going to come to the wrong conclusion about what the right response is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I, I mean, I think the main problem here is that we live in an old country. You know, people are old in Britain, and old people vote more than young people. And what do you expect in a democracy full of old people, except that the system will be rigged against the young? Yeah. Um, on the on the way of sort of delivering this, or whether um, uh, by even discussing this for fifteen minutes on live with Liverwood, we're slitting our own throats because the conclusion will be drawn that we need big handouts for young people as well. But John, in terms of the the politically possible, and you know, it's usually the job of the IA to think the unthinkable rather than to worry too much about the politically possible. But yeah. in terms of ways you might do this, it's often said <laughs> it's you know, extremely difficult to take benefits away. Um, but could we at least rationalise them? I mean, Len's point about the 10 quid Christmas money that was brought in under the Ted Heath government, even if you don't want to take it away, could we at least just say, well, we'll, we'll just increase the state pension by 20p a week? You know, we're not going to go through the administrative process of putting an extra £10 in. We'll, we'll do the same with the winter fuel payment, the bus pass. We'll monetise it and just put that into the state pension. So we'll simplify it. That could yeah. be one thing, rather than lots of bits and bobs here, there and everywhere. Bang, there's your amount. Yeah. Whether you spend it on a TV licence or a bus pass <laughs> or you spend more at Christmas, that's on you. And the other is, do you think, I mean, I, I know I'm on a hiding to nothing here by hoping politicians are going to take a long-term view, but we need to start grandfathering people out of the scheme. It might be difficult to take the bus pass away from my 75-year-old father, 
but you could at least tell me, age 48, that my expectations for a state pension should only be thus and so, and that when I turn 65, I'm not going to get this and I'm not going to get that. Um, we don't even seem to be willing to do that. So, um, you know, when I'm in my 60s, I'll be start saying all these things. I've paid in all my life, you know, where's my bus pass? I need to keep my indoor swimming pool. Where's my payment for that? Um, what's the way to kind of crack this or at least simplify it, John? Well, I think there's a few different things you've touched on there. I personally would get rid of things like the winter fuel payment and the bus pass. I don't know, I'm less bothered about the bus pass. I don't think it's that costly. I think, yeah, it just doesn't animate me as much. Um, but the winter fuel payment, I think, and in the way you suggested, um, I would just get rid of it. It's pointless. Um, but I think the elephant in the room really is that we need to raise the state pension age because longevity as I mean, as is often remarked when we talk about pensions, they were designed for a time where the average person would take their pension for something like a decade or something like that. And now a lot of people are living, you know, through over 20 years of retirement um, on average. So I, and, and the system's got to reflect that. I also actually think that it's one of those things that politicians can do, maybe not painlessly, but it's certainly simpler than a lot of the other things that you're suggesting and would save a hell of a lot of money um, at a stroke. So, I mean, that's if you wanted a bold, to be a bold politician who wanted to make a change in this area, that is what I would do, um, and I'd do it as soon as possible. So that, that's my basic answer. I'd also just, um, in the longer term, on the sort of um, public finance side, I think the case for just getting rid of national insurance and popping it into the income tax system is... I mean, there's no justification for it, but they just haven't got round to doing it. Um, yeah. Ben, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. It's something I've, I've argued for, for for quite a long time. Um, it, it would actually, because there's about 1.3 million, I think, uh, people are still working beyond retirement age. At the moment, they don't pay national insurance contributions yeah. uh, or employee national insurance contributions. If you merge this, of course, they would do, and that would offset the... The, the benefit which they're getting from winter fuel allowances and state pensions and so forth. So I think it will that will be one way of wrapping it all up. And, and Len, do you think that the, the the way to tackle this that might be palatable? I mean, the IA's job is just to get to the solution that's right. It's other people's jobs to work out how to sell it or whether they can get it past the electorate or whatever. But it is to take this longer term view that you know it, it's very difficult once you've given out a bus pass to take it away. Once we've given people ten pounds every Christmas to take it away. But that we need to start getting real that people in their late 40s are not going to get these benefits yeah. when they're in their mid 60s and kind of start to have the guts to say that now. It's easier to, to just, you know, not give me something. Yeah, I don't think you need necessarily be defeatist about that. I, I mean, what we need to do is get the economy growing and get, uh, and get you know, three or four percent per annum annual growth. And you can still have some of these benefits possibly in the future rather than thinking uh, in, in a purely negative sense about this. But I do, I do think it's important to. Uh, simplify a lot of these structures. Uh, I mean, we just spoke about the winter fuel allowance. This is actually separately administered. There is a part, part of the uh, DWP which handles the winter fuel allowance and sends out separate notices. It doesn't come with your uh, with your standard uh, weekly pen or monthly pension. Uh, so just simplifying some of these things would save money. Uh, at the moment, they're just, you know, they, these, it's, it's like barnacles on a boat or something, just accreted a over, over decades. And we ought to have a, a, a much simpler uh, system uh, in place. Uh, I haven't uh, done the uh, Live with Littlewood Optimism Index uh, <laughs> this week. I usually ask uh, people for their optimism, but I, I forgot to ask our first two or three. And I'm in a miserable state of mind because Southampton were beaten 3-1 at home last night. So I would have given a very low number and that would have affected the overall <laughs> metrics. But I will ask each of the, the three of you, you don't need to give me a number, but broadly, how optimistic are you feeling about the prospects of freedom, free markets and prosperity uh, over the next two or three years? John, let me start with you. Uh, I'm glum as well because I'm a Spurs fan, so I hate seeing Arsenal win. Um I, I'm congenitally optimistic, um, and I'm I'm optimistic in the sense that this year will be better than last year because we'll start to get hopefully get somewhere near a new normality. I'm I'm really not that positive about the kind of direction of government policy. I think it's very kind of redistributive, public spending heavy, that kind of thing. Um, so balancing those things out, I'd say I'm about a six out of ten. 
Jamie, you, you've been pretty miserable about uh, everything's moving against us and we're just sort of, you know, it's the last days of Rome, we're just sort of flying the flag because, you know, just about keeps our spirits up, but no prospects of success. That seems to be a summation of your interventions to date. God, you can end on a slightly cheerier note than that, can't you, Jamie? Um, I think that at a political level, I'd give us about a two. Um, but I think that something fun could happen. I think we've been locked up a long time and a good, yeah, say 20% of the population are pretty pissed off about it. And they're the interesting people in the country. And I think there might be a kind of orgy, let's put it, um, maybe literally as well as metaphorically, <laughs> of, um, of kind of, you know, fuck you action. I, I think, uh, I, I imagine a lot of people are gonna leave Actually, I think a lot of people go to places that aren't necessarily politically freer, so to speak, but are looser, right? Places where it's harder for the government to control you. I think we're going to see a lot of underground action here. Uh, I, I think that if you're young and, you know, I'll, I'll use the term broadly, kind of sexy, um, you could have a pretty good five years from now. You know, it could be good, good times coming up. And so I think you're going to see a real contrast between officialdom, which is going to be grim, and repressive and the culture will be more culture be will be pretty, more liberty yeah pretty bacchanalian and quite a lot of fun um i see andy mayer who's still with us on the the zoom side where we broadcast this he lobbed in that if, if he'd been asked for a number he would have given a thing given a six out of ten but uh, given that jamie has now promised orgies he's saying he's up <laughs> in his number to a seven so you've cheered up one of our previous guests jamie well done for that and Len, how, how are you feeling about the outlook over the next two or three years from the point? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, you talked about football before. Um, I, 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 have I actually achieved something, John? Because I wrote that article yes. on CapEx about <laughs> closing down the National League. It's actually happened. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not particularly happy about that, but it's happened. Well, last time I was on here before Christmas, uh, I said four. And um, people were saying, oh, you're far too gloomy. But actually, I'm feeling more like a three or a two at the moment. I mean, there, there just doesn't seem to be any good news around at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so much is placed on this vaccination. And really, I, I you know, I, I say I've, I've actually had the first one. God knows when I'll get the second one, particularly since it's Pfizer and, the, 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 you know, the EU are now playing hardball about it. Um, and there's no, you know, March the 8th, we now said is the earliest that schools can go back. I'll believe that when I see it. I think it'll be pushed to May or something like that. Um, I just don't see any, any particular light at the end of this tunnel. There's so many people who are bought into this kind of lockdown thing. About nine out of ten people say they support it. You know, it's, I think it's extraordinary. And it's Our friend Sam Berman. Yeah, yeah. Sam uh, but, well, OK, a slightly downbeat note to end on, but we do have the promise of the, the, the Jamie White orgies to, to look forward to. So it's not all bad news. You know, there is some, there is some, there is some, some good news. And perhaps uh, I can finish it. But thank you, John, Len and Jamie for joining us. Uh, thank you, too, to uh, all of our previous guests as well. Andy, Tom, Joanna. Brendan, um, who have I forgotten? I've forgotten somebody. I know I've forgotten somebody, but thank you to all of our previous guests as well. We were hoping to be joined by Alex Dean this evening. He had to pull out for family reasons. Hope all's well with you, Alex. We'll have him back on the show very soon. Perhaps I can finish with uh, a bit of an optimistic note as well. We talked about generations being left behind, but if you've got a good idea about how to bring free market solutions to the left behind areas of Britain, you could be 50 grand richer. I've only promised you 50 quid for a uh, answering my quiz question, but uh, Richard Kosh is promising you a thousand times more than that if you can answer uh, his essay question about what free market solutions uh, you think would be the best to help left behind areas of Britain. If you want to see all the competition details, uh, go to breakthroughprize.org.uk uh, and you can find the details there. You only need to submit a very short essay initially if we like the look of it. If the judging panel likes to look at it, you'll be asked for a longer essay and the top one will get a 50 grand prize. Um, if 50 grand is too much for your blood, but you still want a shot at the 50 quid I'm offering you, here is a reminder about today's quiz question. Uh, what is so remarkable about the two people pictured here? 
and this time it has got the right email address at the bottom of it, lwl at iea.org.uk. What is so remarkable about the two people pictured here, and as I said, it's something sort of to do with technology, not specifically to do with any of the issues that we have um, touched on on the show today. Uh, I did mention that um, I interviewed Jacob Rees-Mogg just yesterday on uh, lockdown, the financial consequences of it, how the hell we get out of it. Uh, you can see that on our IEA London YouTube channel uh, as well. So click on that if you haven't seen it. If you're watching us on YouTube and you've enjoyed the show, please give it the thumbs up. If you're not yet subscribed to the channel, hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. Uh, that will make sure we keep you abreast of all of our upcoming um, uh, 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 events. Um, and um, join us next week. Uh, of, I'm interviewing uh, David Davis in conversation. Um, you, again, you can see that on our London YouTube channel. And I'll leave you with this thought about the intervention of the, uh, of the state. If you're, somebody told me, I'm not sure the numbers are exactly right, but if you're caught going to a party, you're currently likely to be fined 800 quid. Pay quickly, though, and the fine is reduced to £400 if you pay up quickly. If you catch COVID at the party and the government uh, insists that you self-isolate, they might actually then pay you £500 for doing so. So if you do the math, we might actually have government-subsidised COVID parties for the young, if those numbers are right. Just shows what sort of perverse incentive government schemes can, can give you. Thanks all of you to watching. Thanks again to all of our guests. Stay safe, stay well, stay free. See you next week. Over and out.